good morning, everybody, or afternoon or evening, depending on where you're tuning in from today. My name is Lodrina Cherney. I'm a SANS instructor in the digital forensics curriculum. So I teach our FOR 500 Windows forensics class, and I get to teach that all over the country, all over the world, and share my years of experience in the security industry with students all over the place. So I'll share a little bit more about myself, but first I'm curious to hear where everybody is dialing in from today. Where are you tuning in from? Got folks from Kansas, from Venezuela, the UK. Awesome, awesome, welcome. So I have taught in the UK, I've taught in London, I've taught in Paris, I've taught all over the United States. And what I teach is Windows forensics. So looking at a computer, and seeing on a Windows host-based system after the fact what happened on that computer. So I'm able to share with students things like what files were opened, what USB drives were connected, and hey, if anybody wants, if you want to get together 20 of your friends and colleagues and have me teach a class in Aruba, I am happy to come to Aruba or Brazil or North Carolina, I had a really, really awesome class in Charlotte, North Carolina a couple months ago. We were just downtown, kind of kitty corner from, um, is it the NASCAR Museum? Yeah. So I've been to Chicago also, also a really awesome place to take classes. I have not yet taught in Romania. Ooh. Ohio. I've been to Ohio a bunch, but haven't taught there. So yeah, awesome. Folks from all over the world, welcome. So that's a little bit about me. I teach Windows forensics. And what I teach in my classes is what I've been able to, um, to learn about over the course of my decade in the forensics and incident response industry. I spent almost a decade of my career uh, in a really small boutique digital forensic consulting company here in Boston, where I'm based. And over that time in Boston, I did a lot of white collar crime. And then I moved to a startup where I did more incident response, SOC monitoring. Uh, I ran the first incident response engagement for a more enterprise security company. And then I've moved on to do other things like policy with Aspen Tech's Policy Hub. So if you want to talk forensics, if you want to talk incident response, if you want to talk security leadership, and again, if you want to invite me down to Costa Rica, you know, organize a class of your colleagues and get a SANS class together, yeah, I would love to come visit you. Same thing with Canada, Toronto, yes. Yeah, so I've been lucky enough to be traveling all over the United States, all over the world. Um, there are definitely more places that I would love to visit and spend a week talking forensics. So that's a little bit about me. Um, so folks, we've we've got a ton of content for you here. You've not just got me for the next hour. We have a lot of people who are going to come share their expertise with you, keep you up to date on the latest security topics. We're not just talking forensics. We're talking security awareness. We're talking about the latest news and threat actors. So in just a moment here, I'm going to kick it over to Thomas Wolf, who's one of our contributors here. Thomas is going to talk about our News Bites segment. And in our News Bites segment, well, how about this? Let me just go ahead and turn the microphone over to Thomas. Thomas, fill, fill us in on what's been happening. Thanks, Ladrina. Uh, Hello, uh, cyber security fans. I've got three stories where I want to talk with uh, today. Uh, first, a joint cybersecurity advisory from US and Japan. They are warning of a cyber of cybersecurity threat actors with ties to China. Um, there has been modification of Cisco IOS router firmware, which is taking advantage of routers domain trust relationships. This is allowing them to move from subsidiary organizations to their primary targets. 
And as we see a lot, the most prevalent initial access vector is stolen or weak administrative credentials. Again, we see this a lot. In this week's Newsbytes newsletter, which you can subscribe to for free at sans.org backslash newsbytes, our SANS senior instructor Moses Frost calls this development, quote, extraordinarily bad. He goes on to say that anybody that's a Cisco's customer really needs to take a close look at their edge equipment. In our next story, Google patches a Chrome Zero Day. Um, they've updated their Chrome stable channel for desktop to address 10 different security issues, one of which is a high severity vulnerability that's being actively exploited. Chrome users are advised to update to the latest version possible. And in the last story, the one that I find most interesting, we've had some more recent developments since the story first dropped. Johnson Controls has disclosed a cybersecurity incident. Johnson Controls is a manufacturer of industrial control systems, security equipment, air conditioners, fire safety equipment. They have been hit with a massive ransomware attack. It encrypted a bunch of their devices, including their VMware ESXi servers. Um, it affected their operations. They had to take a bunch of things offline, and it also affected the operations of at least a few of their subsidiaries. The breach originated in their Asia offices. About 27 terabytes of data were claimed to have been stolen by Dark Angels ransomware gang. <laughs> They're demanding $51 million for a decryptor and for them to delete the stolen data that they've allegedly taken. Uh, Johnson Controls is a multi-billion dollar corporation. So um, the most recent news is that they have been able to get most of not all of their systems back online. So this is speaking to the likelihood that they are not going to be paying that ransomware. Uh, most recently, it's been noted in the news that the Department of Homeland Security may have uh, of contracts with Johnson Controls, which may have sensitive and potentially classified information. So this story is developing. So be sure to check back with us. We're most likely going to have more updates on this story to be on to in the not too distant future. And that's it for News Bites this week, folks. Uh, for more critical cybersecurity news and commentary, don't forget to subscribe to the SANS News Bites newsletter at sans.org backslash news bites. Thanks again. I'm your host, Thomas Wolf. I hope to see you again next week. Awesome. Thank you so much, Thomas. So yeah, there's always new threats, new things to patch against, new things to protect. I've got to talk a little bit about the investigative side. I've got to put my forensics hat on because I'm that DFIR person, right? So we just talked about updating Chrome, always updating your browsers to patch against these new release zero days. So by the way, in the forensics world, one of the things that I love sharing in my forensics classes is that we learn really fundamental skills. And we talk browsers, we talk Chrome, and we spend a whole day investigating internet activity. That's barely scratching the surface. So here's the thing, when we talk about investigating browser activity, you know, even when we update the latest and greatest Chrome, which everybody should do after this broadcast, right? So after we patch our latest and greatest Chrome, some of these fundamental underlying artifacts and forensics, a lot of those aren't going to change. So even as our systems evolve, even as you upgrade to Windows 11, and I saw earlier Abdul mentioned that you're working on a thesis on Windows 11 forensics. Awesome. So I get in my class to share about the latest and greatest Windows 11 activity. But even if you took my class before Windows 11 came out, when we were on Windows 10, you know, these are still the same fundamental skills that you can apply in your analysis. So that's the news for this week. Uh, listen, did you all know that you are going to be a part of this broadcast? So we have a question for you all. Get ready, get your uh, QR code scanners or fire up another browser tab. My question for you all as we enter Cybersecurity Awareness Month is this. Who is responsible for evaluating email links in a corporate environment? I wanna hear from you 
What do you all think? You can go to slido.com and enter this code 6650302. And again, go to slido.com. And if, if you trust scanning our QR code, it's safe, I promise. You can go to slido.com, enter that number on your screen, fire up your phone, fire up another browser window. Let me know as we enter October in Cybersecurity Awareness Month, this is what we're going to be talking about today. Everyone, I like it. So we're going to leave this poll up and we're going to go on. So again, get your browsers ready. Awesome. Enter in that code and while you're answering, we're going to transition over to Brian Simon real quickly. Brian's going to talk about one of his upcoming classes at Cyber Defense Initiative. Brian, I'll hand it over to you. Hello there. My name is Brian Simon, and I am the lead author of our Security Essentials class, SEC 401. I'm also a senior SANS instructor for the SANS Institute. One of the things that fascinates me about SEC 401 and how it separates itself from others in the industry is that you can come and take this class, whether you are new to information security, whether you are newer to information security, or whether you're an industry veteran with years of experience and walk away with information that you can immediately apply when you go back to work. One of my favorite things about uh, SEC 401 and being at the front of the room is that quite, a, quite often after our session has ended, whether it may be a couple of weeks or even a couple of months later, people will reach out to share stories with me about how they've applied the wins that we talk about in class, how they've done that at their workplace. Uh, just one pops into mind uh, recently where someone reached out and they re-architected their Linux servers to give them a, a more defensive standpoint from an auditing perspective. And to me, it just made my heart feel warm that they immediately took back those those things that they could change and made the change and saw positive benefit from, from it right away. It was amazing. Well, I don't really like to, to dabble into too much of, of things that can get me into trouble, but if I had to tell people what my favorite event of the year was to teach at, it would be the CDI event, Cyber Defense Initiative in Washington DC in December. And you might say, well, what makes this event so particularly special for me? It's just the time of year. It's the holiday season, uh, people are starting to relax and I find it's one of the most relaxing weeks that I've ever been in a classroom because as an attendee I've attended CDI before and it's just it's just a wonderful way to chill take in some really important information and then to get ready for those New Year's resolutions of what you're going to change in security at your workplace why don't you go out and give yourself a gift that gives back to you and your organization before time runs out please join me at SANS CDI and for more information, you can go to sands.org slash SEC 401. I hope to see you there. Awesome. Thank you so much, Brian. I, I have to give kudos to Brian as a really great instructor. I was teaching in Las Vegas last month at our big network security event. And Brian had the classroom right across the hall from me. And usually when we get to our coffees and our break times, uh, you know, you see the other classes getting out into the hallway. I could not catch Brian in the hallway because he was having so many conversations with his students. Everybody was so engaged in what was going on. So if you wanna hang out in DC with Brian Simon and SEC, 401. There's a couple of links that are going by in the chat right now. So that is a really great event coming up. Now, back to the part of the show that you all are helping out with. Are you ready? Okay, before Brian's um, break there, I asked you all a question and I said, if you wouldn't mind going to slido.com, the poll is still open if you want to put an answer in. Slido.com and you enter that number, I asked you, who is responsible for evaluating email links in a corporate environment? Okay, number one, the first answer that came up, we have everyone, all humans, Let's pause there 
right now. Everyone is a participant in our security posture. I think this is awesome. And if you said everyone, if you said all humans, if you said the user, ooh, okay, we're going to talk more about that really soon. If you said the user, awesome. Let's let's take it beyond the user. Let's take it to everyone. Awesome, awesome. I love that. So, by the way, I wanted to point out in the question, there are some very carefully worded things like, who does this in your corporate environment? In your corporate environment. You know, in Cybersecurity Awareness Month, in October, which believe it or not, we're in right now, if for Cybersecurity Awareness Month, I hear from my colleagues that a lot of them are getting cybersecurity awareness training. And the number one thing that they are being trained on, that they are being asked about, is to not click unknown links in email. Not clicking links in email. This is like something that in the corporate world we've been hearing for years and years and years. And what is it that we hear for some of us who've been through this training year after year after year? We hear, don't click the links. Mic drop. That's it. Don't click the links. Cybersecurity Awareness Month is over. We've all been trained, right? Yeah? Does, does everybody agree? Oh, man. So some of you said it's the user who should be responsible. It's the user. It's the end user, the recipient of the email. Okay. So, so let's talk about this. There is, let me pull away from email for just one second. So if you are somebody who is involved in securing your corporate infrastructure, you've probably been thinking about not just email. You've probably been thinking about your whole attack service. You've probably been thinking about things like the cloud. And if you look into how we are supposed to secure our cloud infrastructure, you're aware of this idea of it being a shared model for security. You're aware that when we talk about securing something like the cloud, big nebulous thing, that it's both the responsibility of our corporate end users and your cloud provider, somebody like AWS, GCP, um, Amazon. So the idea that we are working together together for security is a really, really big concept, right? So I'm going to go back to a couple other folks' comments. So there was somebody who said, you know, I think it's not just the user. So the person who said, yeah, over here in the top left of, of my screen, you said it's the provider whoever is hosting that email, whoever is securing the back end, the provider should take care of that. And by the way, they should work hand in hand with your IT administrator. And from there, then we can talk about the user. Awesome, awesome. I love that. So thank you to the people who are giving us a broader picture, the provider, the IT administrator, the user going back to everyone. Whoever answered that right off the bat. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. So let's let me think about my world again. And remember, I'm the forensics person. Now, I don't just teach forensics. I am also fortunate enough to have been introduced into the SANS world as a student. So as a student, I've taken lots of forensics classes, leadership classes. I can't wait to dig into other things like ICS classes. And by the way, we've got Dean Parsons coming up who teaches a bunch of our industrial control systems classes in visibility, detection, and response, and another one in management. So as a student 
in SANS classes and in particular in forensics classes. I have been a student and I have listened to the instructor up at the front of the room and, you know, over the course of six days of lecture, six days of content, like there is so much information. And in those classes, just like we're doing here, I would hear a question at the front of the room, like, let's say in a mobile forensics class, how do we get data off an iPhone? So, so maybe if there's a couple uh, mobile forensic analysts here, does does anybody know how how do you get data off off an iPhone, or how do you get data off an Android? How how do you do this stuff? And maybe some of you are thinking, well, I, I haven't taken smartphone forensics. I haven't taken forensics 585. I, I don't know yet. But maybe if you are a forensics person, you might be thinking about a couple different things. You might be thinking, well, you know, I could do this method using built-in Apple tools. I can use my fancy forensic tools. I can hook up this hardware thing. There's a whole bunch of ways to do forensics, just like there's a whole bunch of ways to do security. Yeah, and there's a couple people who are talking about what these options are if we're using the example of how do you get data off an iPhone? You can use your forensic tools like autopsy. You can use your third-party vendor tools, your MDM solutions. Yeah, you can do a little bit of, let's say, hacking and uh, abuse certain protocols. Once you have the data, you can parse your SQLite databases. Yes, I love it. Keep it coming. And oh, I love this. Oh, Elliot has a really great comment. Elliot's got the phone a friend comment. Call Apple. I love it. So even within this group that we've got here today, and thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you for chatting. Um, if you love this conversation, you know, you can send the recording to all of your friends after we're done, but but hang out here just for a moment. So when we talk about mobile device forensics, yeah, we can do our jailbreak. We have all these different methods. As a student, when I hear a question in my SANS class, I'm sitting there in the back of the room. You know what the most common answer is for any question? For any question, that you can ask in forensics, and maybe for some of you, you can expand this to security in general. The most common answer that I have heard that I have given other people is, it depends. So let's take it back to our question that we asked earlier. We asked, who's responsible for evaluating email links in a corporate environment? And we had a bunch of really, really great answers. If you didn't get your answer in earlier, feel free to type it into the comments now. So who's responsible for evaluating email links in a corporate environment? We had a whole bunch of great answers. We had everyone. We have this collaboration, this handshake of people who are working together. Yeah. And then we also have people who say it's the user, it's the end user, it's the person who receives it, the recipient. You know what? I, I think that everyone here is right because I'm going to come back with my favorite answer. And if you're ever sitting in my Windows Forensics class in the back of the room and I ask a question and you raised your hand and you went, Lodrina, the answer is it depends. I, I would give you some kudos and I would say that sounds really, really awesome. So, so let's dig into this question a little bit more and feel, feel free to, to type in the chat because I'm, I'm watching everyone's comments come in. This is awesome. So, so let's talk about a corporate environment. Those of you who work in corporate security who are responsible for administering or helping secure your work infrastructure, what are we talking about when we talk corporate environment? And let's, let's start with the basics. We have our users' laptops. So I'm thinking host-based systems. Awesome. 
but we know it's well beyond our end user systems. And I'm going to chime in with one other one that might be obvious is it's our phones. It's our mobile devices. So in a corporate environment, we are getting way more into this bring your own device environment. And there are people who said earlier, you know, if, if I'm trying to get data off something, I'm going to use my MDM solution. That's awesome. There are so many different pieces in our corporate networks, in our infrastructures. That is really awesome. So we even have things like Joe says, IoT devices. Absolutely. Thank you, Joe. So we've got IoT devices, Internet of Things devices, things that are pieces of hardware that maybe aren't running our Windows or our Mac OS or our other major operating systems. Things that are communicating over the network and things that maybe don't have a screen, things that don't have a keyboard. And interacting with your IoT devices is something that we care about when we care about securing our email. And, and by the way, let me take it back to the real basics of just why do we care about who's clicking on links, good, bad, ugly, or otherwise? We care about if somebody is clicking on a bad link because of this idea of this attacker's chain. You know, you can think of different models like Lockheed Martin's kill chain or other models where clicking a link, maybe download some malware. Next step, that malware reaches out to some kind of network connection to download additional malware, to download additional bad stuff to gain persistence, to be able to not just exist for that one moment, but to really live and persist on those machines. So this is the kind of thing where once you get bad stuff happening on a machine, we can go from that individual system, whether it's a computer, a mobile device, an IoT device, no, I haven't seen anybody yet say servers. When you get that malware moving across your network into your servers, this is really bad, right? Because when you get people from your organization onto your network who aren't supposed to be there, well, we have all of our headline news, right? What's, what's our worst case scenario? What is the worst case scenario? And let me ask you all, what is the worst case scenario after our users click the link and bad thing happens? When we get to the end of that chain, what, what is your nightmare scenario? What are you all protecting against? So, you know, this is where, yeah, so now an incident response is coming into play. Absolutely. And oh, a whole bunch of folks. Um, Ryan is saying an administrative pivot is the worst thing that I can imagine happening in my organization. Yeah, absolutely. Great point. Great point, Ryan. The idea that somebody can get all of the power, technically, all of the keys to your kingdom, technologically. And in my nightmare scenario, the one that I've helped a lot of companies investigate is the nightmare scenario where somebody has that technical keys to the kingdom, and then they take your corporate keys to the kingdom. So the idea that somebody is in your network and they are stealing the secret sauce. They are stealing that magic recipe. They are stealing your intellectual property, your research, the stuff that makes you, you. So let's see, there's a whole bunch of other things happening. Um, Joe saying, I, I can imagine the worst thing happening is that my server shuts down. Oh man. So the idea of loss of service, whether we're talking about Okay, forget about securing email. 
What if your email is not available? What if your customers no longer have access to your services? Okay, and then a few people chiming in talking about business disruption. Funmilio, yes, business disruption, and a couple other folks echoing data loss, my data getting stolen. So this is the why. So why are we talking about email security? And, you know, for a lot of us, again, it's October, it's Cybersecurity Awareness Month. A lot of us are thinking about pushing training out to our users about evaluating bad links in email and clicking or not clicking. Well, let's really bring it down to why are we doing this training? Because of business disruption, because of a possible ransom. Yeah, Desmond, reputational and financial damages? Ransomware? Absolutely. Yep. So Sinan makes a really good comment talking about defense in depth. I love this. So, so let's bring this back to Sinan's talking about defense in depth. And let's bring it back to the question I asked originally. Who's responsible for evaluating email links in our corporate email, in our corporate environment? So there's the idea of defense in depth that some of you touched upon when you responded to the poll. And I love, again, this combination of answers we got where we had people who said it is the recipient of the email. It's the SOC and the security team. It's your spam filters. So it's this combination of your appliances that are scanning email, the people who are managing it and the people who are on the end user system. And let's talk about defense in depth, which if you're not familiar with the term is the idea that, you know, imagine you have a piece of like Swiss cheese right out of your lunchbox. And in that piece of Swiss cheese, you have a whole bunch of holes. So imagine this piece of Swiss cheese is one of your layers of defense. Let's say that you have this really awesome network and email scanning tool, which is part of your defense stack. Well, maybe in this really great tool, there's a couple of holes that this malicious email got through. What's your next layer of defense? Maybe you have a piece of Swiss cheese from somewhere else in the block of cheese, and that piece of cheese has different holes in it. There's still a few gaps, but hopefully when you start layering one layer of defense against another layer of defense, we have this idea of defense in depth. So if your scanning tool doesn't pick this up, maybe the SOC team who's reviewing your email picks it up, but wait, there's still some gaps. And in those gaps, what if we have the next person who comes in, maybe that next layer is our end user who says, you know, something is really strange here. I don't think that the CEO wanted me to click this link. In fact, I think the CEO is on vacation right now. Why is she sending this email? So, yeah, I love the idea of defense in depth to protect against this. So a few other responses here. Levent has responded, I could see a really bad scenario where we get some malware that's uploading to this channel and the command and control, the CC command and control starts communicating with the attacker and then data is leaving the network. Okay, so let's add yet another layer of Swiss cheese onto our stack, right? We might have our network appliance. We might have our SOC reviewing things. We have our user who's evaluating is does this smell fishy or not? But let's say that your attacker gets past the user and the user does click on that link, starts this whole communication channel, this malicious um, connection starting off. Well, maybe you have other layers of defense. So as Levent talks about this attack that's progressing, the user clicked, it wasn't detected before that, 
maybe you now have different tools. Maybe you have your network monitoring tools. Maybe you have your SIM, your EDR, your XDR that's able to monitor that. Maybe you didn't get the budget for those tools, but you have other network monitoring things. Maybe you realize as you're looking at your cloud bill, gee, there's a whole lot of network activity over here. Unfortunately, maybe if your Swiss cheese is especially holy, if you have really big gaps in that Swiss cheese and you have a gap on top of a giant gap on top of a giant gap on top of a giant gap, you might get to that situation where your data leaks, you make headline news, and you end up in our news bite segment. So I think that's probably one of my nightmare scenarios, right? So yeah, there are lots of other tools that we can stack on top of here. Ulu says network segmentation and DLP is your friend. And I didn't even touch on data loss prevention because even if your user does click on the bad thing, well, again, you have other tools like data loss prevention, hopefully in the stack, that are going to protect you, that are going to protect your users. So here's the thing, if we bring it back to the question that we started today's segment with, who's responsible for evaluating email links in a corporate environment? And you can check out from the word cloud here, I think the first answer that came up, which is everyone, seems to be the biggest thing that was echoed over and over and over. So security is everyone's business. It's everyone's responsibility. Awesome. And by the way, this is a theme, that phrase, security is everybody's responsibility, or things like security is a team sport. This is something that's been echoed by one of the United States top cybersecurity leaders, Jen Easterly. So if you are familiar at all with CISA, who is one of the leading authorities in the United States for sec helping secure our infrastructure, um, CISA has put out a whole bunch of cybersecurity awareness month material uh, just like we're doing at SANS this month in October. And Jen Easterly at CISA happens to always say, you know, security is a team sport. Security is everyone's responsibility. So if this is something that resonates with you, there's a couple of links that are going into the chat right now about if you want to talk about security, if you want to keep up beyond this broadcast day on the latest news we have a ton of newsletters. Like if you want to get news bites every week, if you are the security professional who is not just responsible for securing email, for securing your network, for securing your corporation, but maybe somebody who's involved with trying to secure your friends and family, there are some great resources at SANS, um, both for cybersecurity awareness we also have this really cool um, project called Securing the Human, and we have the Ouch Security Newsletter. So these two things, if we want to talk about security beyond just email security and corporate security, securing the human is a great thing to share with your friends and family who maybe don't work in security who maybe aren't getting all of these cybersecurity messages from their, uh, from their employer about how to keep yourself safe, how to keep your devices, how to keep your kids safe, and same thing with the Ouch newsletter. So, you know, before we turn it over to talk a little bit more about security awareness with Dean Parsons, um, I want to hear what are some of your challenges in email security? And what are some of your challenges that you have in trying to keep this great big attack surface safe? 
So what are some of your challenges? Um, Desmond observes that a big problem observed in my jurisdiction is a lack of a top-down approach. So we have this idea of you need corporate buy-in, you need management, and you need your leaders. You need your leaders to understand and have this security buy-in. Great, great thing to bring up. For a lot of organizations, security is going to be a cost center. So unless you work for cybersecurity vendors, security is not necessarily where you're going to see money coming in until bad thing happens and you see all the money coming out, right? So some of you are having challenges with management buy-in. Some of you are having challenges with validating. When I see a link, how do I figure out if this is a spammer, if this is an attacker? How do I do that? So, you know, I'm he hearing and seeing in the comments that there's different challenges you're experiencing. You're experiencing corporate buy-in, leadership buy-in. You might need some tools. So the idea that you need sandboxes or you need to go to virus total. And how do you do that? So let's see, what other issues are you all running into? Yeah, let's see here. Some other issues you're running into. You're running into spoofing issues. Great, the idea that emails appear to be from somebody who it's not really. So yeah, huge problem, right? Um, there's not going to be just one answer to all of these issues. And I've, I've got to come back to the idea of it depends. How do you secure your email? Some of you might be very, very practical and you might say, the way I'm going to secure my email is by educating my users because I didn't get any budget for the cool new security tools, or maybe I didn't get budget to come to SANS training this year. And all I can do is uh, do my own internal company webcast and try and get my users to help me out. So again, some of you might have issues with securing your users and securing your email at the corporate level. Some of you might be working at the technical level. So this is always going to be an evolving story. So even as our security posture needs to evolve, let's think about going beyond just host-based systems, which that's my bread and butter, investigating Windows systems, investigating one device. That's what I teach in my classes. Let's go beyond just the host and let's turn it over to Dean Parsons, a uh, dean who, again, teaches a couple different classes at SANS, including our ICS visibility detection and response classes, and also ICS security essentials for managers. And I was lucky enough to, again, at this same event uh, last month, at our network security event in Las Vegas, I was teaching down the hall from Dean and Dean's students have these really cool hardware devices that they are hacking on and securing all week. And every time I'd pop my head into Dean's classroom, Dean's students were just like really into their projects. So again, a really great person to learn from. Uh, Dean, let me turn it over to you to learn more about cybersecurity. All right, thanks everybody for joining us on this segment. My name is Dean Parsons. I'm a certified SANS instructor for ICS 515 for industrial controls. I'm also a certified instructor and co-author for ICS 418. 
Today, I want to talk to you about security awareness. And this is timely because we're coming up on Security Awareness Month in October. So the topic of today's conversation is around security awareness. Now, on screen, you do, of course, see the SANS Security Awareness Maturity Model. I want to walk through that very quickly and then lead us down to some questions that we have for you to answer in the comment section and get us to the new modules we've created for this curriculum in this area of security awareness. Now, my background is in industrial control systems, so hint, hint, that's kind of where we're going to head to. So as you look on screen, there's really that designed maturity model that allows us to mature existing or create new cybersecurity awareness training campaigns and programs in facilities and organizations around the world. And this can be anything from, again, starting your program from a non-existent place today, right up to having metrics and a framework, capturing the and managing the human risk of security awareness. Now, the question I have is, and I want to get your thoughts on this in the comment section, is this. What do you feel is the number one risk to organizations today? Your options are, is it people? Is it process or is it technology? One of those is what we're headed to. So let us know your thoughts in the comment section. Just to repeat, we want your comments. The question is, what is the number one risk to organizations today, people, process, or technology? Dun, dun, dun. Here we go. So for the past three years, 80% of all breaches have been tied back to some involvement of people. So the answer, of course, is that people element, the people part that has some element to play in a cyber attack, an intrusion, an incident, and of course, a breach. Now, this metric is fantastic from the perspective of where we go next to reduce human risk. So as an example, security now we know is not just a technology problem, but it does include that human risk. But if this is manageable to reduce this risk across IT organizations and, of course, industrial control systems. And this is what I want to share with you today. The question now is, and again, drop your comments in here and your thoughts on this. So what about human risk as it relates to industrial control? Control system, ICS or OT, operational types of environments, critical infrastructure, power grids, wastewater management facilities, heavy manufacturing, as an example, water utilities. These environments absolutely have people in them, managing them, using those engineering assets. So we, of course, have never left out the engineering component in our SANS security awareness. But what we've done recently is drastically lifted that up and updated our modules and significantly added additional modules as well, again, to reduce the risk of human risk inside control systems in this case. So on screen, you see the usual SANS security awareness products we have. And today we're highlighting that ICS or OT piece. So as we talk about the new security awareness modules, I want to keep in the back of our minds here, if you're coming into control systems for the first time, ICS or OT, I really want to remind folks that there's a really great way to start deploying this kind of module. And it's really aligning with the safety culture already in place, which is usually fantastic in control environments. So as we go through this, I want to just briefly introduce us to some of the roles and responsibilities that folks have in control systems and how we can deploy short videos with knowledge checks and a way to track these metrics as we're reducing risks, specifically in engineering environments. So the new content we've developed is really around the 20 new modules and updated progressive modules we've created. Myself and Tim Conway just recorded this in the SANS studio, and we've had a team of folks going through making all of this, uh, all the modules work together. Now, what's important to know about each of these modules is they're catered to different elements or roles within a control system. So the learners can be those who operate a power system, for example, or any critical infrastructure element. These folks can be supporting those engineering environments, but also the modules are for those who manage the risk, the human risk, and the cyber risk of control system environments. What I want to do is just indicate that folks that are the ICS end users ICS practitioners, even security awareness folks specifically with a dedicated role, or those such as engineers making changes in the ICS environments at a technical level. So that could be anything from process engineers designing and optimizing a plant process, 
It could be field technicians, programmers, as I mentioned before, and technicians who repair devices and engineering systems in the field. In addition, ICS security folks, network engineers, and even folks who obviously operate the process right to management, those who have the responsibility and ownership uh, and, and accountability for control system environments. So what we've done is now we're going to introduce you to some of the names of these modules. Now, each one of these modules varies in length, but they're consumable, fast to deploy. And again, they have those knowledge checks, which lines you perfectly to mature your process over time, linking back to that maturity model we've seen a few moments ago. So as an example, in the area of the end users for ICS, we start folks off to know what an industrial control system is. And then we walk those individuals through an attack scenario inside the control system, which as we'll see in these modules, of course, is different than an attack in an IT environment. And that's what makes these modules so specific to the control system. And I would say so helpful and more valuable to the control system. So we're talking about ICS specific awareness campaigns and modules. So, of course, we talk about the newest things in control systems and the related risks, anything from ICS removable media right up to ransomware attacks as well. Even real-time case studies we've seen recently in sec different fields and different sectors of control systems globally. So we talk and go over the attack overview, but also focus on the risk service, how to reduce that, which includes reducing human risk. We, of course, talk about the ransomware aspect and recent events such as Ukraine 2015, 2016, the Oldsmer water event, perimeter attacks, and so on. And, of course, we still have leadership, ICS-specific leadership modules as well. And just an example of these, before we get to the last section here, is we go from anything from IT types of attacks that could lead to an ICS attack with spear phishing attack campaigns that we've seen in the real world, right down through things like delivering attacks through supply chain, security awareness, and how to roll these types of modules out to those ICS removable media, such as a USB stick brought into many plants. And as we know, industrial control systems do have a lot of folks like vendors and integrators that support our environments that may come in with those uh, USBs. So a lot of content on practical risks and threats that we see out there and ways, of course, to reduce those risks as it relates to the human aspect. We, of course, talk about more transient devices. Ransomware definitely raises its head because it's one of the top risks we see today intruding into IT and industrial control systems although they do have different impacts in those different environments. And of course, we cannot forget the real-time case study of the VPN filter attack. And really this case study that we walk through in that module looks at the perimeter attacks and perimeter defenses we can deploy to protect our control system. Leadership is not forgotten here. We focused heavily as well for leadership, those who manage the tactical practitioners in the field and woven throughout each module, there's distinctions between how things would work on IT versus how things are really on the ICS and the differences between them. Of course, we do not move away at all from safety. That's paramount in all of the modules that Tim and I created for this entire load of modules. So the prioritization of safety is seen throughout as the number one critical infrastructure uh, risk to reduce. And again, to reduce this, it's for, from the human perspective in all of these modules. So to recap, before we see an image here of the type of training modules you'll see is these main takeaways right here. We've recently redone, updated, modified, and created new content, 20 plus new live recorded instructor-led modules. So myself and Tim as certified instructors, we present the content in this way, similar to what we would do in a classroom environment. But we have the addition in these modules to flash up when we're talking about certain aspects, different animations to make those come to life even more to communicate the educational value and the practical application of the learnings from each module. Now, as mentioned before, these are threat intel based they're use case driven, which means this is not fluffy pie in the sky stuff. This is 
We have seen this before in multiple conditions in multiple environments around the world, and we've learned from that, and we're sharing these lessons learned and practical risk reduction capabilities with you in each of these modules. As we have just seen as well, you can select the modules for the roles designated in your environments. So it's not just assign all of them to your entire team if you don't wish to, but there's tons of value there. But of course, you can segment this out based on the role. This, as usual with the other SAN security awareness modules, can be hosted with the SANS platform or host it in your own LMS. It's SCORM compliant. You can also brand it with your logo, et cetera. And again, effective short knowledge checked modules that allows you to do tracking, metrics, and reporting directly that can align with your overall organizational maturity model. Now, just to close out here, and we're going to be looking for comments here as well, or any questions that you have we can address, is that here we have myself and we have Tim going through the production process, recording process, where we have the back-end team putting animations on this, making this more come to life. But it's still that instructor-led kind of scenario. So you kind of have this a little bit of a rapport with us as we're going through and teaching and hopefully helping guiding and sharpen the skills of your engineering teams your ICS practitioners, your users in the ICS space, and obviously, of course, your leadership. So as we round out and complete this part of the, uh, the, the piece for today, uh, just a quick note here, myself and Tim, here we are in the studio recording these new modules, and I have to confess, we had a blast doing this, uh, but I also confess that Tim and I and, and a whole bunch more folks in the ICS curriculum are really obviously passionate about control systems, and so we really feel proud about putting this content together and really hope that you're going to get the value you expect from this. So want to say thank you for connecting with us today. Uh, hope to see you in the future at some events. Again, I teach 515, 418, but I'm usually at any events that we see with regards to ICS. And a final thank you and be prepared for October, which is, of course, Security Awareness Month. And uh, we're going to make sure you can uh, get some of this content available to you to help with your program in ICS environments. Thank you again. Thank you, Dean. And as some of you have seen, Dean is multitasking, answering and responding to comments on LinkedIn right now. So feel free to keep chatting. Um, if you're in the chat, I would love to hear from you all. What is one takeaway that you've taken away from today's session? So please share, what is one takeaway that you're coming out of today's session with? Um, I'll share for myself, uh, I think Dean echoed a couple of things that we were talking about earlier with the whole it depends scenario. Dean talked about people, process, and technology. And for me, that echoes how it's not just one thing. So security is incredibly nuanced. It depends on how mature your organization is. It depends on how much buy-in you have. And feel free to share in the comments one thing that you all learned. So our time has flown by. That's it from me. I would be thrilled to see folks in a future Windows Forensics class. But uh, thank you for tuning in today and come back next week. Thanks, folks. I think I'm uniquely qualified to teach this class because I've had a wide variety of exposure to different roles and positions in information security from my early days as a software developer, working as a network defender and a chief information security officer for commercial organizations. I've also been an independent contractor who's done a lot of incident response and penetration testing. So I've had a wide variety of exposure to, to different roles that we have in information security.